nearly four years. But I'm 30 years of horticulturist, so my post, my undergrad, my postgrad, I've had some really cool horticultural jobs. I was head of school of horticulture at the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh for 10 years and director of learning. And I've also been the president of the Chartered Institute of Horticulture, which is the professional body for horticulture. So I'm not trying to tell you that to show off. I'm trying to tell you that because I want you to get that I understand horticulture. <laughs> and I think we do an awful lot of horticulture in, in nature conservation work. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing in the Isle of Man, some of the work we've done for ages, and some of the work that we're trying to do going forward that really benefits nature as, as horticultural skills. So this is a picture of one of our flagship nature reserves. This is Close Sartfield. Audience participation after lunch. Who's been to Close Sartfield Nature Reserve in the Isle of Man? At least two of my colleagues have. There must be, but shame on you. We need to, oh, actually we'd love to host IEM. I'll just put that out there. So this, this is Close Sartfield. Is that horticulture? Horticulture is the manipulation of plants to get plants to grow differently. And we do a huge amount of that in our nature reserves. And one of the way we actually created Close Sartfield, and this was a picture taken last year on a new nature reserve of ours, is the use of green hay. Who's used green hay? Who could answer a question what it is? Okay, so imagine you've got a field, a meadow full of wildflowers that are all in seed. And you harvest that before they ripen and pop seeds and then you spread that on another piece of land and you let it all dry out and all the seeds fall down and the following year you get the flush of growth of all the new plants. So we've done that now in a, in a new nature reserve that we're working in partnership with Colas with at Balaun. So that's green hay. I think that's horticulture. Um, Miranda told us a lot about pollinator projects. How do we, how do we get more flowers? How do we get more for nature in, in the communities? And, and these are just four examples. So. We'll, we're advocating, we're lobbying, we're infusing to our parishes, our, our local commissioners around the Isle of Man, about how they can do, more, do, less, do less grass cutting, you know, mow free May. Um, and that's happening. And here's one example of this patch here with the orchid in. This was religiously cut by the guy from one parish who had to cut the grass every year. And it took about two or three years of encouragement before they realised that they didn't have to cut it. And we've managed this year to save it and the orchids are blooming and, it, and it's a success story. Here's a roundabout in Peel. And this one, the last one, this is, this is where Douglas Council uh, and a horticulturist in the Douglas Council team, they've been sowing what they call wildflower mixes for years and some of the, what would have been a, a, a bland grass verge where they cut. So they're saving on cutting, they've got wildflower mixing. They call it wildflowers. Is it wildflowers? Probably not. It's a bag of seed that's come across, as we call it, from the UK and has been sown and the flowers come up. So we'd like to try and do that better because we want to encourage that. And so what we've done is, is actually this is one of the gardens at Russian Abbey and this is run by Manx National Heritage. And the head gardener of Manx National Heritage is a horticulturist, Philip Payne. And Philip's, got, uh, I'll big him up, he's very much become an expert in, in pollinator gardening. So that's the mixtures of annuals and perennials. And this is one of the borders at Russian Abbey. Fantastic. So Phil's come up with a mix that we've loosely called the Manx Pollinature mix. Um, and we are trialling it this year. We trialled it this year for the first time. And so this is the trial bed. There's a garden on the Isle of Man called Milltown. And that's actually the only Royal Horticultural Society registered garden on the Isle of Man. Um, and there we've actually set up this plot area. There's, there's six treatments in there. I won't go through them all now. If you want to know more, please ask. But um, don't blink. So that was at the start of the year. And then through the year, it grew into this fantastic thing. Now, now that's just year one. And in year one, lots of the annuals come up. But the clever bit is that in year two, we'll get the succession of the perennials coming up. But they're not native plants, so we're not calling it a wildflower mix. But the ambition is that we will have a mix that we can promote, distribute into schools, get people to use them in their back gardens. So it's very much an urban garden, polynature mix that we want to trial. We've got one more year of trials where we're going to big it up a bit more. And then we hope to start supplying it around the island as a Wildlife Trust approved seed mix. So that's pretty cool. Um, linked to that is the whole thing around biodiversity recording. And the Manx Biodiversity Recording Partnership is something that is, is part of the Wildlife Trust. We host that now with other key partners of the Isle of Man government, Manx National Heritage, Manx BirdLife and others that are contributing data to our island's data mix. Um, 
We don't have a recording center. But this is a, a picture, actually, some of you may know Gail Jeffco. Um, she's a lepidopteran expert. And this is Gail training some of our volunteers in, in, in butterfly identification that will link, we're hoping, to that, to that pollinator project. And that's where we're hoping to pinch some ideas from the pollinator project about how the best way of doing citizen science will be. We plant lots of trees. Planting trees is horticulture. You've got to grow them in the first place, that's horticulture. You've got to plant them, you've got to establish them. And all that is horticulture. And the Isle of Man has got some significant ideas, evolving ideas for how many trees we need to plant. And then there's that whole conversation around carbon credits and corporate interest and, and how do we do that. But undoubtedly one of the best opportunities for us is the agri-environment scheme. So Max Wildlife Trust, we are the delivery partner now for the Isle of Man government's agri-environment scheme. We're coming about two and a half years into that. One of the big schemes that that links to is woodland creation and in areas of habitat creation in the farms. So tree planting is important. We're also looking at our nature reserves, about actually being able to buy land, fund, fund that land, some of that land, by planting the right trees in the right place that we can also get biodiversity credits for, or carbon credits for, and the funding opportunities now for ecosystem services for all of us are, are huge. And, and that train is definitely coming that we, we need to collectively try and jump on board. One other example of agri-environment is, is horticulture. Most of our agriculture is not horticulture. It's, uh, I won't go down there, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it isn't, but it's, it's, there's, there's some horticulture. Now, that isn't the best example. You know, if I was at G's Fresh in, in, in Essex, they wouldn't be impressed with that as a horticultural field. But in low scale market gardening, horticulture is a success. It's a success. They're running a, a farm shop. And also they're doing it in a nature friendly way. And, and by not worrying too much about all the weeds, the bird life that was down there last winter, this is a place called Paul Vash, it's one of the only places where you could go and find tree sparrows on the island and linnets and lots of other red listed birds for the island are attracted to the, to the feed that's created in some of those horticultural patches if they're managed in a different way. So again, that's pretty cool as well. And we're hoping that through agri-environment, and this is Rob who's our agri cultural farmlands bird officer and David who runs the agri-environment scheme for us, we're getting baby steps forward in terms of more farmers doing more things for nature, including their horticulture. Um, you wouldn't think that peat was horticulture, but there are nurseries, uh, mainly in the UK, that are producing sphagnum moss as a crop. It's, it's grown in tunnels, they produce it and they sell it and you can buy it. And this was um, one of our officers, Sarah, actually carrying out a trial earlier this year, planting sphagnum on an area of peat that had been restructured. So this is where we had peat hags. The peat hags were there, we'd leveled out the peat hags. You then plant sphagnum moss and you put brash over the top. So this is, this is basically brash from where, where heather's been flailed up and that just protects it, the sphagnum. And we're, it'll be interesting to see if we can start recolonizing and, and protecting some of our peat through the transplanting or the planting of sphagnum peat plants. Um, that's me wearing a COVID mask. Um, the reason I put that in is that one of the things I can... Oh, I'm going to... Time out. Um, Ash dieback, Colara. One of the ways that we might be able to save the remnants of the, the Fraxinus, the ash trees on the Isle of Man, is through grafting. So without getting too technical, if you, from the small percentage of the population that are resistant to ash dieback, of which there are some, you can spot them because every other one's dead and there's, there's one tree alive. You take the sign material from that and you graft it very, very low down on the hypercotyl of, of a new seedling, then you can actually get fresh ash trees to come up that are resistant. And we're setting up an orchard in one of our projects, early days, but we've done our first successful grafts, part of a workshop with the Manx Garden Plant Society, Preservation Society. And that's now a method that we're, we're going to work in partnership with the local nursery on to graft more. So a great example of conservation horticulture. Lara's already talked to you about this. I'm just going to add a little bit more around underwater horticulture. So when Lara and I visited the seagrass nursery in Wales, um, it was run Project Seagrass. They had a horticulturist that was trained by someone that I'd trained at Edinburgh years before, and they had a marine biologist. Now, I'm a horticulturist, and I think there's a real opportunity for more horticulture to get involved in seagrass work. So currently I think it's driven mainly by marine biologists, but there's a huge amount of horticulture. And it's grass. And I want you all to go to Countryfile 
and watch the episode on the Argyle Hope Spot. And, and it was on about six weeks ago. And in there now, there's a, there's a huge project in the north of Scotland where they're, tr they're now translocating seagrass instead of using from seeds. And they're translocating the rhizomes. And Nature Scott have approved this. And they've proved to them that this is a more viable way to do it in their location. I'm not saying everywhere, but that's one way that this, that this horticulture underwater is now being used. So Argyle Hope Spot Country Farm. Um, we do open gardens because we want to get the community involved. So I think, as Miranda was saying before lunch, how do we get more people wildlife gardening? And this whole concept of wildlife gardening is important for all the wildlife trusts now. It's, a, it's important for all of the whole sector of conservation, isn't it? But particularly within wildlife trusts, we're looking at that. So some of our members, our Southern Group members, certainly they open up their gardens once a year. There's a, there's a series there of gardens that people can go and visit where our volunteers are really doing great things in their gardens for wildlife. We have a fantastic gardener's fair. Again, two of our, people have grown plants for the year. Everyone brings them all together. They're all collated, put in a, put in a, in a horse paddock. Um, people rock up and we're, we're, we're promoting the use of comfrey and there's people helping with wheelbarrows and doing, there's another one of our volunteers teaching people basic propagation. But it's a gardener's fair that's underpinned by us wanting to get more people doing wildlife friendly gardening. Because it's such an opportunity for us. Um, I'm not going to steal my colleague Graham's thunder, but he's going to tell you a little bit more about how we're measuring that in a digital way in his, his talk later. But, but wildlife gardening is really important. Um, we also created, when I was at Edinburgh running the School of Horticulture, one of my roles was to create certificates in field botany, practical horticulture, botanical illustration, etc. So two years ago, we've created a certificate in wildlife gardening. We also created one in wildlife observing, and it works, and it's great. It's something that we would like to... To, to encourage more. And this was our first graduates. Um, I'm going to come back to Lucy in a minute. So Lucy was one of our first graduates. But, but really exciting now is, is that through the Central Wildlife Trust team, in terms of our governance, if you don't know, there's 46 wildlife trusts, 44 are UK, there's us and Alderney that are outside the UK, and there's a central office based in Newark who act like a hub and spoke and a facilitator for us all. And they're now interested in maybe this could be something that could be rolled out across all the Wildlife Trust as a way, not just as a piece of paper, but imagine you've got a community group and in that community group there are champions for wildlife gardening who have been on a wildlife gardening course and can then be the, the people that roll that out across all their community group as the champions. And it's a nice thing for them to get back in return for being a volunteer champion for wildlife gardening. So that's where the vision is going for that. Mil Lucy I mentioned, so Lucy was so good on the course, she's one of these students on the course who have been about Two sessions of the course, I'm thinking, I really need to work with you, because you're really, you're great. And, and then we applied for our Team Wilder, which is all about community engagement. Um, Lucy got the role. And Lucy now, and Hannah, our community ranger, who's funded by Lloyds Bank International, fully funded by Lloyds, she is driving now community engagement. And this is a, becoming one of our flagship projects that's, that's just expanding. So this is at Milltown Garden. We're now running their wall garden for them, we're growing food for them, we're linked to their cafe, we're setting up, we're developing their nursery. It's really exciting. Most cool of the whole thing is that the volunteers entered the local show and they're two of about eight prizes that they won this year for some of the veg that they're growing in the garden. And there's this whole community enthusiasm about growing, learning, horticulture, but also doing it in a nature-friendly way. And imagine they'll go and disperse. And as, as several people have said already, in an island, you can make a big difference, can't you? You can make a big difference in a microcosm if you, if you build that enthusiasm. So that's the Milltown Gardening Club. This is examples in Douglas. Here's Hannah again. This lady runs a fantastic community garden. Again, Graham's going to tell you a little bit more about her, so I'm going to move away from that. But Douglas Council in particular are now looking to us to work with them in social, areas, social housing areas. How can we get more of the local community involved in, in growing food, but growing food in a really nature-friendly way, which is also very exciting for us. It's perfect. We, we don't want to just do, we want to do the two together, and then we'll hopefully stimulate more people to, to, to actually do it. Um, this is at Milltown again. This is now trees. We need lots of trees. There is one tree nursery on the island. My, my background was really tree production. That's what my undergrad and postgrad was in. And, and if, you, if you Google tree production in botanic gardens, you'd find a lot about nursery management. But there's a, we need to grow the right trees, and ideally with Isle of Man provenance. We don't have our own nursery, but now we're looking to partner with Milntown, who do have a nursery, and they want us to help them expand their nursery. 
So they're the first batch of seedlings of trees that are now growing in Milltown Nursery, being looked after by our Milltown Gardening Club, which is again pretty cool. And so there's, I think there's an exercise, it's probably happened last week, or it's going to just happen this week, where we're, we're now collecting seeds, sowing seeds, or storing seeds over the winter, stratifying them, ready to sow next spring. So the production of trees through our volunteers and the nursery partnership is, is growing. Um, I mentioned the Charlton Institute of Horticulture. There aren't gazillions of members, but it is the professional body. And, and one thing I realised in the Isle of Man when I got there is that I missed my horticultural you know, conversations. So we've now set up a little group of professional horticulturists. Um, I'll point this guy out and embarrass him. I hope he watches the range of video in this. I'll show it to Steve. So me and Steve used to room next to each other at Pershore College of Horticulture back in the day. So um, it's actually lovely now to come to an island where Steve's a horticulturist, you know, amenity gardener. Um, we've got the head of Douglas Council. Um, we've got someone called Lovely Greens, Tanya. If you go on YouTube or Instagram, she's got a fantastic presence around horticultural growing, nature-friendly way. Adam runs Milntown Garden. Jane's the leading architect on the island. Hyde is a fantastic designer. Rob works at Milltown Gardens as well. Karen actually runs properties for Max National Heritage and volunteer groups. So we're starting to build, and there's a few that weren't at the last visit, we're starting to build a community of professional horticulturists. It's not because it's elitist, it's because it's actually a, a, a status. And from that has come the pollinator mix, from that's come the Milltown collaboration at the garden, from that's come the nursery, from that's Philip Payne. The, so there's real synergies there about having those conversations, as well as it being a really nice thing for me to do. There's a lot going on in this picture. So, we have here Andre, one of our conservation officers. Andre's a horticulturist, um, also an ecologist, and Andre has been growing plants linked to, he has two jobs and he works for the University College Man, so some of his horticultural students help him grow some of the plants. So, what's in that picture is, here we've got a Manx native plant. Here we've got an elected member. Some of you, some of you I know know Michelle Haywood. Michelle Haywood's a, uh, Dr. Michelle Haywood is a scuba diving business running, but now one of our elected members. And she's also one of the department members for DEFA. So we don't have a DEFA, we have a DEFA. So Dr. Haywood is that. Um, and this woodland is our Hairpin Woodland Park, which is a partnership with the government and Milltown and Rotary International. It's a biosphere project. Um, and it's an arc, it's almost an arc for some of the rare Manx plant species that we're now propagating, transplanting into the Hairpin Woodland Park, um, and that will become an art residence for them in terms of plant conservation. So another fantastic example of how horticulture has been used at real cutting edge or coal face conservation. Um, and I must be early, which is shocking for me, <laughs> um, but that's me, thank you. <laughs> 